Thank you. Thank you, the organizer, for giving me the opportunity to be here and, and to talk here. In, I mean, the topic is not very related to, uh, to uh, what, what you are doing, but uh, I think there are some, some kind of connection. And I hope you, you like this. So yeah, uh, and this is the, the result that I'm going to present here. It's a joint work with uh, Chris Sow, who is also a postdoc. And, um, and the idea of, uh, of this inverse van der Waals problem is, is try to recover uh, some electromagnetic property of a medium by making a non-invasive measurement. So the idea here would be uh, to try to describe the electromagnetic properties of an object from outside, in this case, from the boundary. That's the reason why it's an uh, inverse boundary value problem. All right, so the outline of the talk will be as follows. I'll first uh, des descri describe the, the problem. In the second point, I will show our contribution. And in the third point, I will give uh, an overview of the proof. All right. So yeah, let me start describing the problem. So now the idea is that we want to recover some electromagnetic property of the medium. So we want to, I'm going to, to say what are the kind of electromagnetic property that we are looking for. So uh, so they are, they are uh, magnetic, permeability, which is, will be denoted by mu, electric, electric permittivity, which will be denoted by epsilon, and electric conductivity. Which will be denoted by, by sigma here. So, the, the, those are the electromagnetic property, but we are going to assume some constitutional uh, aspect of the medium. So we are going to consider that the medium is, uh, is linear, is non-homogeneous, and is isotropic. That, that means, in terms of mathematics, it means that we will have a medium omega, which will be defined by, uh, modeled by an uh, open bounded subset, and we will have here three functions. There will be omega, this will be, in, in our case, in R3. And we will have these functions, which will be real and, and in this case, positive. And will be eventually will be bounded. The same for uh, for electric permittivity. So sorry, epsilon one. And for the conductivity, we will have the same, but it can vanish. So it will it will be like zero, and then sigma one. And ag and again bounded. So. Moreover, of these uh, assumptions on the medium, we will assume that the, the kind of electromagnetic field that we are looking at are time harmonic. So that means uh, they are time harmonic and the only current density that, the, that we will have is the ohmic current density. So that, that means that the electromagnetic field we are looking or we are interested in are of this kind, are of the kind A equal to H of X, and we will have some frequency, that's why it's time harmonic, which will be positive. And then the, the equations we are interested in are the so-called time harmonic manifold equations that are described omega and now mu h equals to zero. I a lot of h plus r i omega nice epsilon e equal to sigma of e. And this is the manifold equations that we are interested in. All right, so. The, those are the physical background that we are, are going to use for, for testing uh, or for knowing the electromagnetic properties, which will be the mu, the epsilon, and the, and the sigma. <coughs> so, so first, we have to say what are, what are going to be our boundary measurements. So we have to say something about what kind of solutions we are expecting to have for this, for this system. So, <coughs> so in, in, in the situation that the, band, the omega is is Lipschitz, is bounded, bounded, and Lipschitz, Lipschitz, and the coefficients are like this, so I won't say, but they, that means that they are in L infinity, so I, I'm just requiring that they are in L infinity. Then given T a tangential, tangential uh, vector field, vector field 
on the boundary of omega, that will be denoting the boundary of omega. Then the problem, the problem of finding of finding E and H holding holding M the Maxwell equation and the Maxwell equations and satisfying either um, plot of E on the boundary equal to C or uh, rot of H on the boundary equals to P. This boundary problem is for both. For every omega in C, except for, for this, the following subset, for zero union F, union F. Right? I denote it here because this, this is usually called the set of resonance problem. So the point is that at least for, for many of those omega, we can solve the problem. And it's, it's well posed, but not for all. And that, that will be somehow important here. Now, the, now we have what kind of solution we have here, the, the kind of solution that we are expecting there. We're going to, to describe the model of, of the boundary measurement as the solutions restricted to the boundary. So the way that we are going to see the interior is, is through the solution, but the solution on the boundary. That, so that, that's, that's will be the, the idea. So <coughs> in this case, since we don't have label like, positive for the problem, the most appropriate way of, of describing the boundary measurement, so boundary measurement will be through the Cauchy data set. So the Cauchy data set associated to mu, epsilon, and sigma will be just the pair of, sorry, this is the normal the unit normal vector field pointing outward on the boundary. Okay, so this will be a, the pair of the electromagnetic fields on the boundary such that E and H hold ME. So this, is, this will be the, the kind of boundary measurement that we are, we are going to consider. And now the inverse problem is to recover mu, epsilon, and sigma from the Cauchy data set, from C of mu, epsilon, and sigma. Okay, so that, that means that, that we are trying to recover the, interior, the internal properties of system through some kind of boundary, non-invasive boundary measurements or boundary measurements or whatever you want to call it. Right, so we have to somehow like go from the, from the boundary to the interior. So here, we are not going to recover the coefficients precisely, but what we are going to do is we are going to prove some kind of uniqueness we solve. So that means that the, that the different kind of, of medium, they cannot produce the same kind of, of boundary, boundary measurement. So that, that could be like a rewritten in the following way, uniqueness. It's as follows. It's given given mu j, epsilon j, and sigma j, with j equal to one and two, and omega greater greater than zero and fixed. This is important. Otherwise, the problem is is easier. Uh, then the question is, I will use the Spanish uh, mark questions. Do you do you want epsilon one? Sigma one equal to two mu two epsilon two gamma two implies that mu one is equal to mu two sigma one is equal to sigma two and epsilon one is equal to epsilon two. So that's the question, right? Like uh, so they cannot the answer to this question is saying that different kind of, of medium cannot produce the same boundary boundary measurement. All right, so <coughs> this inverse this inverse problem generalizes uh, a very well 
of very well-known problem in the problem called the Calderon problem, uh, where uh, the idea is to, <coughs> in that problem, is to reconstruct not the electromagnetic property, but just the electric. So the, the problem there is just to reconstruct the conductivity from some boundary measurements. And in the, that case, the boundary measurements are the so-called delay to Newman mass, because the problem is well posed. <coughs> All right, so this, this inverse problem, inverse problem was, pro was proposed by Sommer Salo, uh, in Saxon, and Cheney in, in 92. And the first uniqueness result and reconstruction was given a year later uh, by some Finnish mathematician uh, that uh, were Ola, and Sommer Salo. And they, they prove uniqueness, uniqueness for uh, uh, C3, C3 coefficients, coefficients, and C11 boundaries. C11 boundary. Boundary. And, uh, and recently, in 2000, 2010, uh, Jenny, Salo, and Ullman, Ullman uh, prove uniqueness, prove uniqueness for a, for a smooth coefficient, smooth coefficient for uh, or in not in an ice an isotropic. Tropic media. So in that th that case, the coefficients for certain and isotropic media. Then in that case, the coefficients are not anymore functions, but are, are matrices. All right. <coughs> okay. So this is somehow the, the history of this problem. The history of the, this problem is, as you say, a generalization of the Calderon problem, and the history about the Calderon problem is is larger. And uh, I will uh, comment some of the reference later. But by now, we keep that advanced for the Maxwell equation. No, 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 they are not arbitrary. They are very restrictive. They are actually, all the coefficients has to be in the same conformal class. And I think even they don't have the conductivity, so they don't. Yeah, I think that's that's probably one of the hardest problems nowadays that you can do. So that means that, the, that you, you they have to pre prescribe a conformal class, in this case, the matrix, the matrix will be something as one and here some matrix G naughts. And now the difference between one, so mu J will be CJ, like this. So the difference will be just in the conformal factor, in a positive factor. And all has to be like that. And even, not only the, and that's one of the points, not even mu J has to have the same, in the same conformal class, but also the epsilon has to be has to live in the same conformal class. So can, there are no like two metric lying there. It's yeah. just one. Yeah. It's not. It's this way actually. It's one is the Euclidean direction, and the other uh, direction has to be some simple manifold in order to get some kind of uh, uniqueness for some Jordan situation four and so on. But yeah, it's not. I mean, it's very very. It's actually this is actually the conformal class. Where you can construct, still construct CG or solution. So it's like a, that problem is in the beginning, actually. All right. So now I was going to tell you our contribution. The contribution is omega in R3 bounded, bounded and elliptic. 
on Lipschitz. Now, uh, mu j, epsilon j, and sigma j in uh, C1 on omega, those two, and satisfying satisfying that the, the alpha mu 1 x is equal to mu 2 x alpha epsilon x equal to alpha epsilon 2 and alpha uh, sigma 1 equal to alpha sigma 2. on the boundary and alpha less or equal than one. So then what we have is is that the, in the condition that I pose the, the, the problem, so we have uniqueness. So we say that the, that if we have the same coefficient set, we have that the coefficients are equal, right? So now the, I, I'm going to tell something more. It's like, a, yeah, our domain will be bounded relational domain. The coefficient will be C1, so the, we are only allowed to have one derivative and that will be continuous. But we have to assume that the coefficients are equal on the boundary. And the reason for that is that, that we want to keep that the domain is Lipschitz. The, the, the point is that by, by now there are results where you can do determination on the boundary, but they assume that uh, the boundary is, has to be smooth. We are, it seems so, we are now working on, on removing that assumption. And actually, I think, I think we have already done, but that to be in the side state, I, I would say, I would say the like this approach. So then we have the, the unit. All right, so it's like uh, the, the same boundary data for uh, in determine the, the coefficients in this video. All right. Question? Yeah, everything here will be isotopic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Everything here will be isotopic, non homogeneous, but isotopic. All right. Um, yeah, and the point is that this result, this result uh, matches the regularity of a result due to Haberman and Tataru for the, for the Calderon problem, at least for the global uniqueness, because they prove it also for, uh, for Lipschitz conductivities, but they have to assume some smallness condition. So, By Haberman, Haberman, and Tadaru for the Calderon problem, for the Calderon problem. At least for the for the global uniqueness <laughs> case. Yeah, and actually, in order to prove this theorem, we are going to use the same the same machinery that they they developed to 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 deal with the Calderon problem. All right, so now we are going to for the an overview of the proof. So an overview of the proof, so let me just say like proof. All right. <coughs> so yeah. Now the first the first thing one has to, to think of is like we want to recover some in, in internal information from some boundary measurement. So we have to get some kind of relation between the boundary and the interior. And uh, the simplest way to, to get this is by integration by part, because integration by part relates directly what is happening on the boundary with interior. So actually, it's the case that uh, one, proof, one, one can prove very easily by integration by part that, uh, yeah, so let me call it gamma 1, and I will say now who is gamma 1, T of mu 2 uh, gamma T. So here, gamma J. It's just to reduce the notation. So gamma j will be epsilon j plus i sigma j over omega. And now, since omega is fixed here, we don't, we don't care. We just introduce all the nodes, these new parameters. So now uh, what one can prove is that the equality of this Cauchy data set produces this kind of integral identity. So it's gamma 1 minus gamma 2 e1 dot e2 minus mu 1 minus mu 2 h1 dot h2 d of x equal to 0. So the same kind of boundary measurement produces 
uh, this kind of integral formula, right? So now, now the idea is, is kind of clear, right? It's like uh, if we are able to somehow to produce set of solutions that are somehow the, the product of the electric field are dense and the, the magnetic field are somehow like negligible, we can somehow deduce that one mal one is equal to gamma two. And we can do the other way around to get the equality between mu one and mu two, right? So that, that could be like the first idea. But the point is that this is, this is somehow difficult at this level. And the reason for this is that the, if you look at the mass of equations that they are not here anymore, but uh, I, will, I, I will remember you that the H is at the level of the rotational of U, of E, sorry. So it's just, that was one of the mass of equations, but they're written in a different way. So <coughs> if you think of that, now if you want to construct like a very good family of solutions, you will have to control at, at the same time the solutions and the derivatives. And actually you will have to do like the rotational of H1 and H2 at the same time. And this is, believe me, this is difficult. So, <coughs> so keeping this thing in mind, this equation we can also substitute in the, in the another equation for Maxwell, and we can get this other thing. <coughs> so this is substituting this in the other equation, we can get this kind of second order uh, partial equation. And if you look at uh, the equation, it's the, 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 the leading term is almost the Laplacian, or at least almost a perturbation of the Laplacian, because we are allowed now to, to, the, to make one derivative of mu. So it's almost the, uh, the a perturbation of the Laplacian. And the idea actually, because I'm thinking of the Laplacian now, is because uh, for the Calderon problem, uh, yeah, so let me say something, yeah, this about the Laplacian, and, and just to point it out, to clarify what I'm saying, is just that remember that the Laplacian is just the rotational, twice the rotational mass, mi minus, sorry, uh, the grad of the divergence. So this is actually the minus Laplacian, right? The vector Laplacian. So the reason why I'm thinking of, of the Laplacian is, is because, because we know how, I mean, it's well known now, how to construct solutions for this kind of equation. V equals to zero, this is a scalar equation. Equation. So now we, we know how to construct a good family of solutions for this kind of equation. And, and the kind of, of, of CGOs or the good family are called like CGOs, and I will write no mistakes. This is a good family of solution that, uh, that we were going to use to uh, extract information from the integral formula. Is um, They are called like CGO solutions, and they have been constructed uh, for different uh, regularity frameworks. The first one was, was Sylvester and Ullman, and uh, later Brown, and then eventually uh, Haberman and Tataru for the same kind of regularity that we have dealing here. and still don't know what is more efficient if, in this way on the, on the system. All right, so yeah, the, the good families of solution known for, for this CO, the perturbation of the Laplacian, are called CGO solutions, CGO solutions, and are solutions for that equation that I wrote, the scalar equation that I wrote there of this form, V of GZ, is equal to E Z. Here set is a parameter that I'm going to use now. One plus W W Z with uh, Z being in C N. I don't I don't understand. C oh yeah yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, CEO solutions means, uh, you, you will see somehow from here, it's like uh, 
complex because uh, the set is complex. W uh, geometrical optics because they are they have the kind of form of, of geometric optics. Okay, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, so that means complex geometrical optics solutions, and they are solutions of this way that uh, that are solutions for for this three order perturbation of the the Laplace set, and this three satisfy this nice condition here, that is set that dot set is equal to three. Don't you know that this is possible because we are in C n. And and we have that W set goes to zero vanishes in some sense as the parameter set goes to zero. And I said vanish. Let me put it vanish in like this just to say that. Uh, that is in some sense because uh, the way that Haberman and Tataru proved this vanishing thing was in, a, in average. So it's not like so clear or it's not always the same. The same case. So yeah, the first people, uh, all right, some comments before. It's like uh, this CGO solution are, are somehow used in this way and the set that dot set that is chosen as this because the, the, the leading part of this first part is actually uh, harmonic. So it solves the Laplacian, right, equal to zero. And the other part, as you see here, is a reminder. That's, that would be the property. It's a reminder, but it's also a correction. So this is introduced here. This correction is introduced in order that the harmonic solution or the B is solution for the for the perturbation of the Laplacian. So this is at the same time a reminder, but also a correction to, to introduce this. So the first people uh, who who introduced the or who used those solution, at least for the inverse boundary value problem, was Sylvester. Sylvester and Ullman. Ullman. But uh, everyone can see that the ideas, at least the inspirations, come from, from Calderon. Who, who proposed the problem in 1980, at least for the conductivity equation. Right, so they, this guy proved or constructed this solution for Q in L infinity. Okay? So this is like a like a nice three order perturbation of the Laplacian. Recently, to to deal with the Calderon problem uh, in 2013, Haberman and Tataru and Tataru uh, constructing the same kind of solution with uh, some some different properties, but the, I mean just in the remainder, but the same uh, the same idea for Q being as Two sigma, I did not hear sigma one because it's the conductivity, the same conductivity, one over two, with sigma in C1 of omega. So if you see now here, here they, they had that the, co the coefficient was in L infinity, but here you don't have that this Q is anymore in L infinity. So it's actually you have putting two derivatives on the coefficient, and the coefficient only has one derivative. So it's very singular in that sense. It could be so as a first order perturbation, but have greater properties than having a, a, a first order perturbation. Okay, uh, right. Now our our goal is to somehow to try to mimic as much as possible the idea of constructing solutions for zero order perturbation of the Laplacian. So the idea will be first. The first idea will be relate the solutions for the conductivity equation to solutions of a kind of let me call it here a Schrodinger equation. I don't know. I probably this is not the best place to call that Schrodinger equation, but uh, let me call it like that, Schrodinger equation. So yeah, <coughs> the the thing, the idea for us that will be to relate solutions for the Maxwell equations with a system of the, of the following type. E, A, H, now, now you will see why this is an H, uh, minus K squared, should I put this? I, A, plus Q, where Q is a matrix of H times H, uh, and now this applied to to a, a vector set equal to zero. So that that would be the goal, like relate the Maxwell uh, 
the solution for the multiple equation to this kind of, of system. And then I'll try to apply the machinery that they've developed for, for this and, uh, and see what happens. All right. So the first thing is like, uh, remember that I said that, that we were assuming that the coefficients were equal on the boundary. So that means that we can extend the coefficients out of, of, of the domain omega in the same way. They can be actually the same, the same coefficients out of omega. And moreover, we can assume that the, or we can make the extension in such a way that they are constant uh, out of a big hole, okay? <coughs> that, I will keep that just, I mean, we don't see the technicalities, but at the end, I might, I might need it to, to, to see this, this thing on the boundary. So now I'm thinking, as I said before, I'm thinking to get Laplacian. And if you look at the relation that I wrote there, in order to get Laplacian, we need to have, uh, to, to have the, the divergence as well, to make this like elliptic in some sense, right? So what we are going to do is just take the mass equation that we have before, and we are going to take divergence. So, so we have rod of E, I'm going to write zero here. That's I omega mu H. So that was the first mass equation. And the second mass equation will be H plus I omega. That, that was now, I write only sigma. So everything is here because the two coefficients are here. E. And now I'm going to take just divergence in both equations. So this will be equal to zero. And now I have divergence of mu H, divergence of mu gamma e, right? So that, that, that will do. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is just, I mean, now you, you see that I have four equations, but I have only two unknowns, so this is clearly over the curve. So what we are going to do is to, to, to make the system have some sense, we are going to introduce some scalar component. Remember the scalar component is something that is somehow artificial here, it's something that I'm introducing. So the scalar component are follow, so uh, mu h, here, and for this, no, I can the other way around. This is E, so this is E, this is I omega gamma mu H. And now, uh, yeah, and now I introduce in this one, minus gamma, minus one, divergence gamma E, and in the other one, uh, plus mu minus one, blah, blah, mu H. So yeah, the point is that, that what I have made is just somehow like making the, the, the system elliptic in some sense, right? So it's like I have introduced this scalar component E and H, E and H that are somehow artificial. So now solutions for this equation, they are not anymore solution for Maxwell. Except that if E and H, the, the smaller E and H are zero, okay? That's the only way that they are Maxwell sol solutions for Maxwell equation. So now I'm going to try to forget about this big system and I'm going to just think like kind of formally what is, what is happening here, right? So it's this system that you have here, it can be written in the following way. P plus V X equal to zero, where X will be like, uh, for example, uh, H, H, E, E, okay? In that way, right? And now what happened is that, that this P that I'm writing here is, is constant coefficient first order operation. It's constant coefficient because what I'm doing is whenever it hits the, uh, the, the coefficients, I, I put it in the, in the second part, in the C order. So what I'm having is just that P is first order perturbation and moreover because of the electrification that I have done is that P times P is equal to minus Laplacian times H. And now you see why it's I wrote the H. It's because I, I introduced two scalar components. And now, yeah, and it's important to mention here that the V, V only depends on first partial derivative of the coefficient. So uh, mu and gamma and alpha is less or equal than one. So if there is only first partial derivative, right? So now you can see how I'm, I'm going to try to, to, to look for the, for the Laplacian, right? It's like somehow like composing this twice and I will get somehow the Laplacian, right? But yeah, there is a point. It's like if you do it like that in a very naive way, you, will, you won't end up having a zero order perturbation. You will have a first order perturbation. And that's, I mean, that's more difficult. So, <coughs> so what we are going to do is rescale the solutions in order to get some other system that is more suitable to get this zero order perturbation. So, um, yeah, I keep this.
All right. <coughs> so now the, 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 the thing is the following. The, it's like a, from this P plus V that I have there, I made the following with scale, mu minus 1 over 2, I4, gamma minus 1 over 2, I4. And now I call this uh, I solution, that would be X, the X that I wrote there. But now I, I call it, I rescale it in this way. And what happened is that the I get the same kind of matrix, 1 minus 1 over 2, I4, this matrix block, mu minus 1 over 2, I4. And now what I have is another system, W. In the same way, this is the same kind of operator as before that I will call Dirac operator in the sense that it's not the, the real Dirac one, but in the sense that when I make the product, I get the, the Laplacian in that way, I, right? So now I have a scale in this way. I get here another matrix W, but it only depends on first partial derivative, the coefficient. And now the good thing about this, and it, it seems to be kind of magical, but it also happened for the conductivity equation. So what happened is that now, when I do this kind of trick, P minus W T of theta, this is actually the uh, equation that I, that I wanted to have, minus K squared I A plus Q, okay? Yeah, plus Q. And the same, the same kind of thing happen if I do, I do this reverse, and if I use like a, like conjugation. So it's like I have, I have been able to get some key order perturbation. That happened also with the conductivity equation, and actually with the same kind of scale. All right. And now the good thing is that the, the equation that we have is a key order perturbation, but ha contains two derivatives of the coefficient because you see that when this hits this, this already have first partial derivative, when this hits, you will get like second partial derivative. So now we are somehow in the, uh, in close to this uh, scalar equation. All right, now the procedure is the following. Now this is theta and this is equal to zero. So this is the kind of equation. So now let's think how we recover the solution. So the, the way that we recover Maxwell solution for Maxwell equation is we construct solution for, for this kind of Helmholtz equation, vector Helmholtz equation. Then I guess E, just defining E <coughs> as P minus W T of theta. And then I get the X, just making this rescale. So this is X, and I'm making this rescale. And now if the E, if E and H, the little one, the scalar part, are zero, then I get solutions for Maxwell equation. Right, so that will be a, that actually will be our procedure to to do this to do this thing. Using uh yeah, using the techniques developed by by Harman and Tatar. So now, as I said before from the beginning, I tried to convince you what, what was the idea. It was just to try to uh to construct like at the same time that the electric field were kind of dense and the magnetic field were not dense, or they could be negligible and the other way around to, to get this, uh, the information about the coefficient. And I said that, that that could happen from the first integral identity, but I said that that was difficult. Now, since we have this kind of, uh, of, kind of uh, procedure to, to deal with the Maxwell equation, we are going to, to use the same, the same kind of computation here to prove the following new identical formula. So this is new one. It's different to integral formula, to the one uh, I wrote before. Now, if we have the C, mu one gamma one is equal to C, C mu two gamma two, we can prove this integral formula. It's just that the Q one minus Q two, so where Q one and Q two are the potential for the corresponding solutions, satisfy the following, uh, this is C one equal to U two equal to zero. Okay, now this, this is solution for Dirac, so Dirac equation, so it ca it's just solution for, for a system of this, type, of this type. So it's just, you know, if you want to construct them, the only thing you have to construct is first set and then use this. And you don't have to do anything about the scalar component because it can be like, it doesn't have to be like uh, uh, producing any Maxwell solution. But now seed, seed one is again solution for this kind of equation, but has to produce Maxwell solution. So it has to have a scalar component equal to zero. Uh, has to produce some solutions for Maxwell equation. 
all right? Has to produce solution for mass water pressure. Right. Okay. Now I won't go. I, I won't go into how to construct the solution because most of the thing. I mean, constructing these solutions for this is following the same ideas and in the as Habermann and Tataru did. But there are some technicalities because uh, you have to make this vanish, and also because you have to get different orders in the electric part and in the magnetic part. So it's it's. I mean, it's a bit more technical, but uh, I won't go in detail to, to this thing. But now what happened is that after we have we, we get the, the a corresponding CGO solution, the, the same kind of solution that you have over there, and using the same kind of properties that uh, that we have from, from the paper by Haberman and Tataru, but like uh, specified to this situation, we can prove that Q1, Q1 is equal to Q2. All right, that Q1 is equal to Q2. But that's not the end of the problem because that Q1 is equal to Q2, it means that the some uh, relations that involve second partial derivatives satisfy that they are equal. All right. <coughs> so now what, what can we extract from Q1 was equal to Q2? The reason why I ask uh, to, to write this, to, to use the, the, pro the projector for this is because uh, the kind of system that the kind of thing that we can deduce from the quality Q, Q1 and Q2 is a bit is a bit ugly because it's too long. But I won't write it. I will I will just say what is the idea, what is the idea behind this. So the thing is that the, what we are able to prove is somehow from Q1 and Q2 we can deduce that the difference of gamma one and gamma two satisfy the following condition: one over two minus gamma one over two plus D of gamma two, one over two, minus gamma one over two, plus, plus A, gamma one over two, minus gamma, I mean, sorry, this is two, one, and every, every time is one over two, one over two, plus, plus D, mu two, one over two, minus mu one, one over two, Equal to zero, that's the first equation that we have. This is A, and now the second equation that we have is uh, mu two, one over two, minus mu one, one over two, plus W, double capital W, W, mu two, one over two, minus mu one, one over two, plus C, uh, mu two, one over two, Minus mu one one over two plus d gamma two one over two minus gamma one one over two equal to zero. If you see, this is just like a zero order perturbation system for for solutions that are of this kind, right? So now the point is that the, we know that the this the difference of these two solutions so this. This solution, I mean, di this function, the difference of this con conductive uh, e coefficient and the difference of this coefficient are h1 in the whole Rn, because we extended it in such a way that they were equal outside. And actually, the point is that those are completely supported. So, what one uh, hope here is that the by unique continuation, these, these solutions are like, like zero, right? Now they are, they are equal, the solutions are zero, and therefore the, the, co the coefficients are equal. Now the point is that that happened if every coefficient could have like good properties. But the point is that the, the only thing we know is that A, B, you cannot see from here because I haven't said who is A, B, C, and D, but believe me, this A, B, C, and D are L infinity functions. So for those are, 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 are okay, but not for those. This D and W contain second partial derivatives of, of the same coefficient. So they cannot be thought of as um, as functions in L infinity, they they are like more sing more singular. So the idea is that, that in order to deal to deal with this uh, system to prove the unique continuation for this, we didn't go to the to the literature to look for this kind of result. What we did was actually use the same kind of estimate that wrote Haberman and Tataru to get the result of unique continuation. And <coughs> and yeah, that's all right. So that's what I'm going to to tell you how to how to do this, which is very simple. Yeah. OK. 
that is very simple. Um, So the point is that, that is that, that if we have that f and g belong to h1 of r3 and they are completely supportive, that f is equal to g equal to 0 is equivalent to f plus b f plus a f plus b j equal to zero and plus g plus w g plus c g plus b f and this kind of potential are, are this this kind of singular potential this v and w so so th this this is the, the unique continuation principle here, and the, the idea to, to how how we did it. Probably there are many other ways, but since we have already these estimates by Haro and Tataru, was very uh, straightforward to use them. So what we did is just <coughs> since they are completely supportive, f and g are completely supportive, this u uh, f and v is that x g, they belong also to h one of R3. And the reason is because since they are completely supported, the exponential growth that uh, uh, it can produce this, this solution, they, they, they disappear immediately. All right, so now this, this U and V, instead of satisfying this, this equation, they satisfy uh, the following equation. They satisfy uh, U and let me let me write just the the rest is the is the same right and and the same for this uh, to say that dot grad v plus the same thing so what i mean is that that, that the only thing it changes when the, the derivative hits the exponential at, at this kind of operator up here so it's the same coefficient u and v satisfy the same equation but replacing the laplacian for for this part f operator they are called actually part f operator okay All right. So now, now in order to uh, to to prove that the, that u and v are equal to zero, I'm going to introduce what is the symbol for this. So the symbol of this operator is p theta of psi is the square modulus square of psi minus two i theta dot psi, right? Okay. And it's very simple to check the following property that P theta, and now I put here. This is the modulus. This is this is complex, so this is the modulus, and I and I put it to a power of s of the Fourier transform of u in L two is the same as having P theta h minus one of the operator two theta grad u u Fourier transform in L two, right? Because this is actually one one full power of w. Sorry? Oh, sorry. It's uh, I, I have a problem, and this is always I have the same problem. U is this, and V is this. So V it has this thing. U doesn't have it. No, thi this V is supposed to be capital V, and this is supposed to be W capital W. Yeah, sorry, sorry for that. Yeah. All right. So then we have this, this kind of property that, that is immediate, right? Like you can lower one, one power of this just because we are, we are putting there the operator. So this, uh, so now that, that you are very used to that, people in the community on inverse scrolling is not that used to that, but the, this is some kind of Steinbruggen spaces, right? It's not subtly, but, but it's very similar to some kind of Steinbruggen spaces. So with it's kind of homogeneous, so with this mm, dot there, and to the power of s, right? So then, this property that you have there is nothing but to say that u in x dot s of theta is equal to Laplacian plus two theta grad u, and now x dot in s minus one of theta, right? So this, this uh, Habermann and Tatar introduced those space 
for constructing these three your solutions. And uh, they use it not only for the constructing of the solution, but for getting uh, some improved decay that they, it was missing, totally missing from the techniques that, uh, that we had available before that. So they, they prove it, this CGO solution for C1 and the remainder, and that's the, the property of the remainder what was exactly missing for, for the C1 conductivity. So now the point is that the, we, one can use those spaces to just to, to prove the unique continuation, and the thing is very simple. The thing is just that the, by perturbation, if you, you see that the, 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 the system that we have here is just the, this, this kind of, of operator plus perturbation. So what we can do is just perturb here, add and subtract the potential as we have here, and if we can bound the, the potential by the, by the left-hand side with a, a small norm, we are done. Because that means that the U and V are zero and the F and G is zero. And I won't do that here, but actually that's the case. That's the, that, that's the point. That's what they prove for, for a different thing, but it's the same, the same kind of spirit. It's what they prove. So they, they managed to prove that for some S, for some S that I would say already is S equal to 1 over 2, for some S, they are able, I mean, they are able to prove that the, this potential applied to this, op, uh, to this operator with this norm is less or equal than the right hand side. And what you get is this that x dot s theta plus g x dot s theta is less or equal than a little constant that you can make as small as you want times the same, the same quantity, u in x s theta plus g in x s theta. So from there, since this is a, a constant you can do it as small as you want as theta goes to infinity, you can prove that u and v are actually equal to zero and f and g are equal to zero, okay? And then you have the, you have the property of, of unique continuation. All right. Uh, yeah, and then you have the property of unique continuation. All right, all right. And just, just to mention how, how that happened because we are so used to that here in this community, so I will tell how, how that happened. So the edge is actually one over two, and that's related to the regularity of the potential, right? So the, this edge one over two, you see it's very, it's related to the, the regularity that you have there. And, and the idea behind, behind these estimates that are there, they are just localization type estimates. So they are just localization time estimates that were introduced in this context by Harriman and Tataru. And the kind of estimate were the following, were that plus g of z to the power of 1 over 2, x now with a cutoff, a cutoff function or, or just a function in the spark class, it can be bounded in L2 just by g of z in 1 over 2, u in L2, that uh, this was just like u in x dot 1 over 2 of zeta, and just, because this is homogeneous and this is not, it's just like the non-homogeneous space. So this is x, u, and this is x, 1 over 2, zeta. Right? So this is kind of estimates. And, and the reason behind this kind of estimates is like that. Here, this is either a cutoff function or a function in the spark class, so what we are doing is multiplying by u in the Fourier transform you are convolving, and when you convolve, you are somehow like dispersing the mass of u. So the mass of, uh, sorry, the, the Fourier transform of u. So the mass of the Fourier transform of u cannot get concentrated, for example, here, and where this, where, where this vanish, that is, it could be the problem. So this kind of thing cannot happen because of the, of the convolution, and actually the point is that, that you can do that at the same order of the modulus of zeta. And the reason why here appear the modulus of zeta, or the, the, the best that you can put in this way in the modulus of zeta, the reason is because this, uh, the modulus of P of Z, it's, it's the, I mean, it's the characteristic surface, or is the, the symbol of this second partial differential operator. It can be decomposed in two parts. One part which doesn't vanish, and another part, both of order one, and another one of, 
which vanish of order one in, in the characteristic surface of this. The part which doesn't vanish is actually of the order zeta. And the part which vanish actually, it can be controlled because of the convolution. So that, that's the reason. All right. And yeah, I'm, I mean, in look at that in general, you cannot have this if you don't have the, the cutoff function here. So if you don't have like a, that this is somehow localized. This, this effect can be seen as well in, in Kahneman estimates, where, uh, where you are doing it somehow, like controlling the L2 norm, for example, in bounded domains, the L2 norm with power tau by the, by the operator, but that's in, in a different space. Okay, so yeah, so that's, that's what I wanted to tell you. And I wanted to see, to point it out, the, that this, the same estimates can be proved to use Unique continuation is just to emphasize there is a big relation between between unique continuation and, and this Calderon problem, or, or this kind of inverse boundary value problem. So all right, to sum up, I would like to tell you that, that what we have been able to prove is just a inverse boundary value problem, uniqueness for an inverse boundary value problem for Maxwell equations with C1 conductivity, which matches the, the non resolve for, for the Calderon problem. We have used that, the, the standard technique of CGO by using the uh, the method developed by, by Haberman and Tataru. In order to construct these solutions, what we did was like constructing a zero, a zero order perturbation that which whose solution were related to the Maxwell equation, so there were this kind of relation. And we, we applied the same kind of technique that Haberman and Tataru did. And just in case that, the, because here there are more technicalities and the ideas can, be, can get hidden, the idea why this problem becomes difficult, at least as far as I know, it's because the way we have to construct this, the, the solutions, I mean, the, the whole problem lays in, in constructing good family of solutions. The point is that the way we can construct the solutions by now is per, by, by perturbative methods. So we are making perturbations of, in this case, actually, the Laplacian. And the point is, the less regularity you have for your coefficients, the higher is the perturbation or the more singular is the perturbation. So it's more difficult to control how the solution should behave. And, and that's, that's basically the difference. I mean, the difficulty right now in this kind of problem. So yeah, I think that's all I wanted to tell you. Thank you. <laughs> if, if, if there is no, I have a question. Can I ask you one question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, what came before? Uh, the, the introduction of the spaces or the averages? So it's it's like you, you cannot do any average without it's then it's like a, there is a recent paper using this L two delta space. I haven't read it, but they claim that they they, they have got this idea of, of the averaging using this these previous spaces. I don't remember the authors. I can tell you later. But uh, so so then it's like this the what what came before the the averaging? And then you introduce the spaces. <laughs> 